we have two topics for today. You, I think you have an idea. So it, the first topic is electricity and magnetism and the second one is semiconductors. So why I have included these topics, electricity and magnetism, obviously you have studied so many things in your school, in your classes regarding these electricity and magnetism, this electromagnetic induction, all those things in your physics chapters. In, I think in your 10th itself, you have started studying those things. Then for semiconductors, uh, it's, it's like, it is having pretty good or pretty much importance at this point of time. And you should have a basic idea about what is semiconductor, how this is working and what all fields use semiconductors. So now let's start. <coughs> so we'll start with electricity and magnetism. So it's actually a very interesting topic. Um, and you have studied or maybe in your school, your teachers have practically shown you some of the examples. So it's like earlier in my childhood, uh, when I have a magnet with me, I used to go to my school ground. I used to co collect all those iron fillings. I used to do something with them. I think most of you have experienced that also. And uh, we are people who, um, who never, what to say, who never uh, know what is the importance of electricity and magnetism in our daily life or where we are using these things in our daily life. So it's like we'll not be able to think a day in our life without the concept of electricity and magnetism. Electricity, it's like you will say something, but magnetism is also there in our daily life. So let's see some examples. Okay. So we can start with what is electricity and what is magnetism. So that's the very basic thing, right? So, you know, both of them is something like, which is related to energy or something. So electricity, it's, a, it's we can call as a form of energy and there has some flow of electrons in it. And what we can call as magnetism. In magnetism, it is a phenomena which is associated with the magnetic fields. So these magnetic fields are there due to some electric charges or due to the motion of the electric charges. So you know how electricity and how this magnetism or the concept is being produced. So this is being used in our daily life, but we are, we are not aware of where we are using this. So some of the real life applications are here. So the first thing is electric motor. Uh, you have studied this in your 10th standard, I think. I have seen your physics textbooks and all. So we know that what is the working of an electric motor, what it, uh, what it will do. It will convert this electrical energy into some uh, physical movement or some mechanical form. So these motors generate the mechanical fields and they'll have that electric current which is passing through the coil. So the magnetic field causes the magnetic force within the magnet and it causes that spinning of the motor or it will cause the motor to run. That's the basic principle. So you, you have studied this with block diagram and all I remember. So the next part is in, we are using this concept in microwave ovens. They also work with the help of magnetic force. This is an essential element or essential part in our kitchen nowadays. So these microwave ovens have a part which is called as a magnetron and it will generate this power which is being used for the purpose of cooking. I'll, I'll tell you quickly what is uh, there in this magnetron. We can call this like a vacuum tube like um, structure and it is designed in such a way that uh, it will cause the electrons to move in a particular loop inside the tube. And the tube outside the tube or uh, the tube is surrounded by a particular magnet and it will provide the magnetic force which causes the electrons to move in particular loop and thus this oven is getting doing its purposes. So we, you know about these cards, we have this magnetic strips and all in the cards. So all these are some of the real time examples or all these are the areas where we, we use the concept of this electricity and magnetism in our daily life. So now we are looking into some of the concepts or some of the areas which we are, which we have never thought of, which uses the, or which are using the advantages of electricity and magnetism. So now I'll tell you what is electromagnetism. So you have studied what is electromagnetism. It is a branch of physical science that describes the interactions of electricity and magnetism. So 
so here we have the electric current or uh, electric field or we have this magnetic field and their interactions this constitute the concept of electromagnetism maybe in any substance so this is what we call the definition of electromagnetism now you can see a diagram right so think about each and every one so all these are areas where we have this electricity and magnetism concept or this electromagnetism concept in our daily life so in i am in my home i have the solar panel my wirings my electrical appliances all these washing machine maybe the kitchen equipments and all those things my mobile phones maybe even uh, these radar units or the entertainment equipments in our office this power grid systems everywhere we are using this concept to work or this concept is there in all these areas but we'll never think of while using a, uh, maybe our mobile phone or something do it have some concept of what is related to electricity or magnetism are there anything which is there we'll we'll never think while we are using all these things so this is the basic of physics or this is the basic of all the inventions which we are using now so now i think from the pictures itself you can have an idea some of the common things about some of the common things around you so it's being used in some of the security systems maybe in your bells in your cards and all those systems are using this concept yeah so let's talk about some all these things in detail so first one maybe i can take the security systems or this locking system so this is generally using this or it's like the magnetic locking system so maybe i can use a card to swipe or maybe i can have a security code to unlock it so when what is stored in the memory matches with what i what i'm uh putting the then only the door will open so here also we are using this same concept then we have the entertainment systems our television our radios maybe our phones all these systems maybe even these things are being used in the loudspeakers then alarming systems our our doorbells and all they also use the concept of electricity and magnetism now we will quickly move on to the other areas I'm sorry then in the industries so actually in industries this generators and motors they are the dominant part we have already seen their working right so they 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 dominate or they are the primary source of powers in every industry so it's like we know we know the opposite concept in which they both are working so the generator will convert this mechanical energy into electrical and these motors will convert this electrical into mechanical energy then i'll give you some devices like sensors actuators all these work on the principle of what is what we call the electromagnetism there are some sensors like hall effect sensors magneto resistive sensors there are different category of sensors which work on this principle or maybe these sensors will work on work by considering maybe some of the physical quantities or maybe some electrical signal or something so now we'll quickly move on to some important areas where this concept is being used so the first one is maglev i know all the students here who are attending this session have an idea about what is maglev so what is maglev it it's it is what we call the magnetic levitation so you can see lot of videos maybe in youtube and all where they'll clearly explain what is the concept of magnetic levitation you can go and watch those videos also so it's a method in which we are going to suspend an object it's like the object will be in air and we, we are not supporting it anything we are going to do this with the help of magnetic field so with the help of help of magnetic field i'm i'm suspending something in the some object so you can see in the picture i have uh, put here so this is some block or something which is i i am suspending this so the method by which an object is suspended with no support other than the magnetic field is called the concept called magnetic levitation and i know you are aware of the maglev trains so the application of this magnetic levitation is being used in maglev trains then there are contactless melting magnetic bearings product display purpose all these are areas which are using this concept of the maglev or this magnetic levitation 
So by this concept, we are su suspending an object without any support. We are only using magnetic field for this purpose. So we can discuss this in detail. So you know about this floating train or this floating vehicle, right? You have seen in maybe in newspapers like China has this vehicle, maybe after that Japan come with this much speed and all. So in every, most of the newspapers, we have seen all these improvements or the improvisations that come in the field of transportation through the technology called the magnetic levitation. So let's see what this is. So here, uh, I know there are different principles. So based on different principles, different countries are experimenting on the concept called this magnetic levitation. So I'll, I'll give you an idea what is the principle that is behind the working of the magnetic levitation, the concept of the magnetic levitation. So here, the vehicle can be suspended or propelled on a guidance track, which is made of magnet. I'll, I'll tell you there are no actual train tracks or the train don't have these wheels and all. So here the vehicle is getting suspended above a track which is made up of the magnets only. And there is a linear induction motor based on that this vehicle or the strain is being propelled. So it's not like the, uh, why we are calling this strains is like, it's, it's the long, uh, its appearance is similar to, somewhat similar to that of trains. So this is being done with the help of the magnetic field. This strain is moving with the help of the magnetic field only. So there are two main basic principles in which or based on which this magnetic maglev trains are working. So the first one is EMS, that is electromagnetic suspension. And the second one is electrodynamic suspension. So I'll, I'll tell you uh, in the experiments that are being conducted or those trains which are moving you, using this technology, they, they'll move up at a distance of maybe uh, up to 10 centimeter or maybe 0.39 inches above the surface. It's like 0 to 10. The limit is 0 to 10, but we have invented or practically it's like 0.39 inches above the, uh, what to say, it's not like rail. It's the path which is made of the magnet. So... Uh, I think I'll, I'll give you some more idea about the theory or about the working of this maglev train. So I'll first make a track. So the track, I'm going to make it with some magnetized coil, or I can call the track of this magnetic limited train as a guideway. Okay. So once the train is levitated, levitated means once this uh, field is there and once the train goes above the surface, which means it is levitated, we'll supply the power to the coil, which is below this. So how we are supplying power or this electric field to this coil is that it will, it will keep it, we need to get the strain moving, right? So the electric field or the power we are supplying, this will create, create this um, train to move or which will pull this train to move forward. And the basic concept is the polarity of these magnetized coils. This is making this train to move forward or this maglev train to move forward. And there will be some uh, thrust from this basis also, which will also cause this train to move forward. So the basic concept of behind the working of this maglev train is the magnetic levitation concept. And uh, most probably that uh, the, in the Japan is the country which is running the trains using the concept of aerodynamic suspension. So in aerodynamic uh, suspension method, what they are using is the simple concept called the repelling of magnets. So the concept of repelling between these magnets is used in running a train, which is called the maglev train. And the next concept is EMS. So EMS type of trains are mostly uh, done by the Germans. So that is the electromagnetic suspension. So here in the electromagnetic suspension, I'll, I'll tell you due to the um, overheating and all, we need to have this super cooling mechanisms or all those things in the EMS system. So these are the two main techniques or two main methods by which this maglev trains are working, currently working. Okay, and there are two methods in, which are mainly followed by different countries in the world. So the first one is electrodynamic suspension and the second one is electromagnetic suspension. And the most uh, developers are like Japan, China, all these countries are mostly working on the smaglev trains. So <clears throat> I'll give you some of the advantages of the smaglev trains. 
so it's like this train is very quiet and i think you know the concept of maglev train right how this is working or we have discussed about the working principle and this we are suspending this train above the ground or it is not touching this ground and we don't need these uh, track or something it's like we don't need that physical track or these wheels for this train to work out so the main important advantages of this is that it is a very quiet and it's there is no po pollution and it's really cheap to operate but the thing is that the initial cost to install all these things is really really high and there is no physical contact so there are no losses like something which will happen due to this friction and all and the high speed that is achieved across the different countries of the world is 600 km per hour so i think i have a video with you to show the concept of magnetic levitation so just here and just go through this video this is really uh, a very good video which gives or which tells you the concept of magnetic levitation from spin to diesel to electric power. Today, trains are becoming more futuristic than ever, with maglev trains blazing a path toward the future of transport. So what exactly is a maglev train? Maglev trains are powered by sets of magnets. Magnetized coils running along the track or guideway repels large magnets on the train's undercarriage. They create a magnetic field that causes the train to hover above the guideway and keeps it stable. Power is then supplied to coils in the walls to create a system of magnetic fields that move the train along the guideway. The electric current is constantly alternating to change the polarity of the magnetized coils. This change in polarity causes the magnetic field in front of the train to pull the vehicle forward, while the magnetic field behind the train adds more forward thrust. To make this possible, maglev trains are equipped with superconducting magnets. When cooled to extreme temperatures, they're able to generate magnetic fields strong enough to suspend and propel a train car forward at very high speeds. The main advantage maglev trains have over their traditional counterparts is in their theoretical speed limit. Suspending a train above its tracks eliminates one bottleneck for its speed, friction. With this limitation removed, maglev trains are able to reach much faster peak speeds. To illustrate just how fast maglev trains can be, let's look at Japan's bullet trains. While they've long held a reputation for high speeds, their maglev variants are even faster. In a special test, the speed record of 275 miles per hour for the 300X was absolutely crushed by the L0 series peak speed of 375 miles per hour. Now let's move on to China, where the prototype of a new maglev train that could reach top speeds of 385 miles per hour was unveiled in January 2021. And yet that's not even scratching the surface of how fast we can get maglev trains to go. Even with friction out of the way, maglev trains still have one major limiting factor to their speed, drag or wind resistance. So what if we took air out of the equation altogether? This is where the vac train comes in. These are maglev trains situated inside evacuated tubes or sealed tunnels with nearly all air sucked out of them. Drag would be eliminated almost entirely in these conditions, allowing for higher maximum speeds at lower energy expenditure. Theoretically, their maximum speeds would be somewhere in the range of 2,500 miles per hour. That's about five times faster than the average cruising speed for a commercial airline. As eye-popping as those figures are, back trains likely won't sustain those speeds for the entire duration of the trip. Rapidly accelerating or decelerating to this speed would be stressful on the human body. Instead, they would spend half the trip accelerating more slowly to a maximum speed, then spend the second half of the trip slowly decelerating. Back trains are gradually coming into reality. In 2013, Elon Musk proposed the Hyperloop, a train system with a similar operational principle to the back train. Although it's not going to offer commercial passengers the ability to break the sound barrier, it would be fast. 
The Hyperloop is estimated to be able to reach 760 miles per hour. Testing is currently underway on another back train project, the Virgin Hyperloop, which last year successfully carried two passengers along a test track spanning 1,640 feet. Virgin hopes to commercialize the concept and bring it to market by 2030. Now let's go deeper. What if these high-speed trains could run between continents? It may seem like a pipe dream, but some of the futuristic design requirements for this already exist, such as the underwater tunnel systems that trains will inevitably need to pass through. Let's take a look at the Channel Tunnel, connecting the United Kingdom with France. Most of its length of 31 miles is underwater. The Channel Tunnel took about six years to build and cost almost $6 billion. Scaling this up would take a lot more time and resources. In 2014, China proposed a train line that would start in northeastern China, traverse Siberia, pass through a tunnel in the Pacific Ocean, cut across Alaska and Canada, and reach the continental United States. The project is estimated to cost over $200 billion, requiring thousands of miles of new railway infrastructure to be built, including a 64-mile section under the Bering Strait. It is speculated that this line could take anywhere from 12 to 15 years to complete, and in the meantime, we'll have to make sure our VAT trains can travel at this scale. But all of this being said, wouldn't futuristic, High-speed train systems be a magnificent sight to behold in our ever-expanding technology-driven world. So I think most of you are able to view the video. So uh, <clears throat> I think you have received some idea about what is being called as this maglev train. Uh, so I'm, I'll give you the idea or the concept once again. We'll discuss the concept once again. So we have some track like some magnetized coil is there and we have this, uh, we call this track as some guideway. Okay, and we'll have this train above it and due to these magnets, the train will be levitating maybe about zero, it's like one to 10 centimeters above the surface. Then power is supplied through these coils along with the guideway and it will create this magnetic field and there will be pull which keeps the train moving. So this is the basic concept which which is which is the working of this maglev train and in this video maybe you have seen the concepts uh, some other concepts also so in the case of maglev train uh, just being told like these trains will be moving with so many kilometers per hour maybe 300 or 600 kilometers per hour so for a human it will be difficult in the journey or it will adversely affect them so it's like to the middle of the journey they'll be going with from it it, it keeps gradually increasing and after that, it, it keeps the speed keeps gradually decreasing. So this is the way this journey or the experiments are being done in the uh, maglev train. And the next uh, portions or the things that you have heard in the video is like VAT train. So it's like the there will be an effect of air or these maglev trains may be affected by this wind. So that is a factor which is affecting their function. So what we are going to do in the case of VAC train is, it's like an evacuated train. So there will not be any external factor which will be affecting the working of this particular principle. So in, in near future, it, uh, it's like something which will be faster than that of airlines. So earlier it was like uh, the airlines was the fastest means of communication. Now it is being uh, about this Elon Musk hyperloop and all that also came. So in that concept, maybe in last year, two persons have already traveled in these trains and they have successfully completed their journey without any hurdle. So maybe this will come or this uh, will come in near future. And another idea is there is underwater tunnel system between different countries, maybe like UK or France. So if that tunnel is modified to something like uh, an area or maybe an evacuated where some back train or something can uh, pass through it, then it will be some good inventions or some uh, what to say some new new concepts that are coming so this is uh, something or some idea that is now being worked out using the concept of what is called the magnetic levitation so the magnetic levitation was the base then there came the hyperloop or the vac train or the underwater tunnel system can be converted into this transportation and all so all these are the development of technology or all these are the areas which are using this concept or all these areas come up with so many improvements in the basic concept. 
now you can see a uh, different names these are the names of different trains which are being developed by the different countries so later it was told like uh, the first one here you can see this was by japan it's the l0 series here you can see the miles it's 373 miles per hour it's like 600 above 600 something kilometers per hour then the most of the trains were developed by china then china japan are uh, the countries which are having the fastest trains which work using the concept of magnetic levitation so i think you have received some concept or some idea about what is magnetic levitation and what is the current status or what is which are the fastest trains which are running now we'll see the applications of electricity and magnetism in different fields so it's like magnetic levitation or these maglev trains are one area so we have some other applications for this electromagnetism so this is being really used in the field called the medical science <coughs> so where they are used in magnetic resonance imaging that is mri then magnetic therapy scanners x ray machines dialysis machines so all these are using the concept of electricity and magnetism to work out <coughs> then another concept is magnetic field therapy so it's something which uses different kinds of magnets on our body to improve our health so this is one thing which is being uh, or mostly popular in uh, countries other countries uh, it's like so the countries or the areas which are outside india so this is a uh, formula or this is a criteria which is being used by different persons who are using this to improve their health or their condition so and there are different types of therapy available it's static magnetic field therapy or electrically charged magnetic therapy magnetic therapy with acupuncture so these are the different methods so i thought i'll i'll give you an idea about the different methods also now the next field which uses this is we are using this concept in moon healing then electrical stimulation born healings and brain stimulation then different diagnostic purposes maybe for identifying different diseases this is being used in tissue engineering so all these are some of the areas which are making use of the concept of electromagnetism then i'll i'll give you one one more example this electromagnets link uh, to the medicine it's like mostly related to the robotics i'll tell you there are different electromagnets which are being used in the medical field and also this is being used in industrial robots so these electromagnets are uh, being used by the robots can take some materials maybe some metal pieces or something which which is there in our eyes maybe due to some accident and all they'll be able to pick out those materials in our eyes so this is being practically implemented or so many hospitals are having this ability so while increasing the current we can pull it gently out of that metal that this is being used in some micro surgery and maybe in research field and all and if uh, some children and all they have swallowed some materials and all this method can be used to get that metal pieces or something back from their body so in all these ways we are using this concept of electricity and magnetism as they are correlated with each other and we are making use of the concept in our day to day life and also in different applications around us <coughs> so now the next important application is communication so it's like for the communication we know how much this electricity and magnetism is important or how much this really matters so we know the simple definition of what is communication it's the process of transmitting information from the sender to receiver or maybe source to receiver so mostly this transmission when carried over long distances is mostly done through this electromagnetic waves or maybe the waves which have high frequency so just have a look at the diagram here you know what is happening here right we have the original sound we are transmitting it using an antenna and all those engineering students you will you'll really study about this um, modulation all these type of things what is amplitude modulation what is frequency modulation what is phase and all those things so once we have transmitted we have the receiving antenna we will receive it and we will we'll somehow tune it into the original file or somehow get back the original file so these are some areas where the concept of electricity and magnetism is being used now uh, i think we'll move on to the next area that is semiconductor 
I think some of you have seen or you will have an idea about what is semiconductor. It's like a very small thing, but it rules or it covers the entire world. So I'll, I'll give you a basic of what is semiconductor that you have studied in your school itself. <clears throat> it is something which causes some specific electrical properties. We know what is a conductor and what is an insulator. Something that conducts and something that not conducts. So we can call a, uh, the semiconductor as a substance which possesses the properties of both of them. It's like they'll have some properties of insulator and they'll have some properties of conductor. So the semiconductor is something which have the conductivity between that of a conductor and an insulator. And there are different category of semiconductors also. So we have this intrinsic and the extrinsic semiconductors. So the semiconductor in its pure form can be called as intrinsic semiconductor. And when small amount of impurity is added to it or doped to it, we call the process as doping. Adding impurity to this semiconductor material, we call it as doping. So when the pure semiconductor or the intrinsic semiconductor, when it is doped, we can have this extrinsic semiconductor. That is the original semiconductor material with some impurities. So you can see the, some examples in the diagram below shown here. It's like conductors. I have mentioned some names and there are insulators. Now in the semiconductor region, it's like mostly this carbon, germanium or the silicon. We can call them as, <coughs> I'm sorry. We can call them as semiconductors. So I'll, I'll give you some more detail regarding these. So I think you have seen this group elements and you have studied all of them in your school. So you know that these group 14 elements in the periodic table, they'll be having these four electrons in their outermost shell. So they have their ability to gain or lose the electron equally at the same time. They can do either of them. So I'll give you an example. We have this pure silicon. It's an insulator. So it's like it has the ability to form perfect bond with the neighboring atoms. So once we are performing the concept called the doping into it, we can improve its conductivity. So it's like based on our need, we are going to change these materials and we are using it according to our purpose. Now we'll move on to much detail. We have the same type and p-type semiconductors. So I think you have heard the names of them. So it's like uh, we are changing the behavior of silicon and we are changing it into a conductor maybe by performing the doping. So it's like we add some small amount of impurity. So it's like there are two types. First one is n-type and the second one is p-type. So in case of the n-type, we are adding phosphorus or the arsenic. So it's like they have five outer electrons. I'm, I'm not going into detail uh, into that of bonding and all those things. And the main idea behind this n-type is that the fifth electron will be always free and they'll allow the electricity to pass through. So it's like they have nothing to form this bond. Now in the case of the p-type, it's like either boron or gallium. So in those cases, we only have this three outer electrons. So in the case of uh, performing doping with silicon, we have that three electrons which will bond with silicon. And I think you have heard the concept of hole. So it's like when these three electrons will bond to the silicon and it will create a hole in the silicon lattice, and there, there is no electron to perform the bonding. So Hall will ac accept the electron from any neighboring atom and it, it moves and then it will conduct electricity. So this is the basic concept. So just have an idea that these are the different types that is n-type and p-type and have an idea about what is semiconductor and what is intrinsic and what is extrinsic. Now, What would the world be like without semiconductors? So have you ever thought of a world without semiconductors? It's like, okay, uh, so 
nothing will be working it's like one fine morning we are waking up and our mobile phones are not working our laptops are not working and nothing is working so what will happen so even if it's a very small chip or a very small in size it's affecting or it will affect the whole things that we are uh, seeing in our day to day life so i'll i'll just play a video which gives you an idea about where this is being used in our daily life superman your superpowers are extraterrestrial but my superpowers come from this world they're terrestrial and invincible don't believe me thanks to me your smartphone takes crystal clear shots of all your adventures ever since you got a smartwatch i've been keeping an eye on your fitness while you're sitting here you can come to the rescue anywhere in the world in real time thanks to augmented reality and in your home i make sure the temperature is perfect for superheroes and i can take care of all your other creature comforts as well when it comes to flying well i have to say that ingenuity the mars helicopter flies a heck of a lot straighter than you do and if you decide to go by car no problem i'll always be with you as your guardian angel and smart sidekick what's the secret of my superpowers the power of semiconductors the building blocks of the future so it's like everything that is around us are using what we call the semiconductors so you can see a graph which sees the improvement it's from 1950 to 2010 so their size has reduced their capacity has increased and all those things have happened and it's being used in transistor radios clocks video games personal computers mobile phones to smartphones so this was the range or it's the advancement in the electronic sector as per the semiconductors so in all these areas we are using what we call the semiconductors okay so now uh, i think most of you have an idea about this diode or this transistors right so it's like what is diode diode is a device which will make or which will block the current flow into one direction and it makes the current flow in the another direction so i think you have heard about these diodes or maybe transistor and you have an idea about it transistor maybe we can call it as either it may be it works like a switch or maybe an amplifier so what is an ic i just want to give you an idea about what is an ic ic we call the them as the integrated chips so what is ic or what is it being actually used it's an electronic device which consists of so many elements maybe like i'll i'll tell you maybe it consists of transistors maybe resistors uh, maybe it will have a silicon substrate or of a semiconductor material so this is what is we call the ic and this is being used in every device that we are using now from our personal computer from our mobile phones from our laptops everywhere we are using what we call the integrated chip for this ic <clears throat> so i don't know how much you will be able to understand this this is just the structure so we'll have some wafer and this is the packaging of the ic and this is its constituents or the cross sectional view of what is there in the chip so this is being used in all the category of devices like maybe televisions maybe uh, memory devices maybe microcontrollers or maybe computers radars so all this area we are making use of what we call this ic now i i would like to give you some concept about what we call the power devices or what are meant uh, actually these power devices can be called as something which is used for electricity control or conversion so i'll i'll give you some example those semiconductors which can operate under large current or high voltage we can call them as power devices a simple example is uh <clears throat> i'll give you as an inverter so it's like that inverter device can control the electric power or the electric power flow maybe i'll give you an example it's like maybe in a running train so the power circuit we call as an inverter which, which will control the electric power flow maybe in a running train and all this can be called as an example so this is because we have embedded power devices in it i'll i'll give you two name it's gate turn off thyristor and insulated gate bipolar thyristor so these are some examples 
this is like we, we'll never understand these power devices or something what they'll do is they'll on off these uh, maybe several hundreds or thousands of times per second it's like the current is flowing and there will be fluctuations and they'll on off maybe between 100 to 1000 times within a short span of time and it is very difficult for us to understand this so the main advantage of these power devices is that they'll be able to handle uh, maybe high volume or high voltage maybe several thousands of volts and all. So this concept or these power devices are being used in the bullet trains and all. And this is also being this IGBT, uh, the inverters with IGBT are being used in some devices that we are using in our homes itself, maybe in air conditioners, maybe refrigerators, microwave ovens, rice cooker, LCD televisions and all. So it's like they'll be able to deal with these fluctuations. Now the next concept is MEMS. I'll, I'll call it as the microelectromechanical system. I think most of you have heard about what is MEMS. It's the microelectromechanical system. It's like a, uh, a system, maybe you can call a computer-like system, which consists of micromechanical components. It's like a MEMS will have some sensors, some actuators, maybe some uh, electric circuit or all. So this being set up on a silicon wafer, we can call it as the MEMS. Some examples are here, like uh, digital micro display of the project projectors, nozzles of the head of in inject pin printers, maybe those uh, sensors which are used in the medical field, maybe those pressure sensors, uh, those sensors which use to uh, control the flow rate, maybe either blood flow or something, those sensors which are used to measure these flow, all these can be called as the examples of means. So it's like these two areas or these two uh, inventions, these power devices or these MEMS. They are being used in different products in our smartphones. This is being used by the automobile industry. So uh, these are also some devices or some parts which deals with these semiconductors or some higher parts of these semiconductors. I'll, I'll call them like that. Now I'll, I'll give you some applications where this is being used in our daily life. This is being used in automobile industry. Some security systems, this is the used in medical field, communication sector, and also electronics. <coughs> so think about a car we are driving. So it's like there are 80 to 120 microchips inside the car. And the modern vehicles which use about uh, maybe about 3,000 chips. So think about how the automotive industry will be working without these semiconductors. So they play a very important role in the safety and driver assistance, electrification of vehicles and connectivity and also the entertainment. So I'll, I'll give you some idea. So first, maybe we'll discuss about the safety and driver assistance. So in, in most of these automobiles which we're using now, the semiconductor plays a very important role in the safety system. So you have an idea about these driver assistance systems, right? Maybe there are techniques to detect these blind spot. Maybe there are backup cameras. There, there is collision avoidance sensors are there. Then cruise control systems are there. I, I think most of you know some logic about these mobile, uh, automobiles. And maybe the emergency uh, braking system. So all these makes use of what we call these tips. Then the second part or the main important part is the electrification of vehicles. So it's like now more than these mechanical systems, the electrical systems are controlling the working of vehicles or the electrification of vehicles is uh, into huge nowadays. And in order to achieve this, semiconductors are really important or semiconductors are really playing a very important role in achieving this. Uh, so maybe in, uh, in the working of the electric vehicles and all semiconductors are playing a very important role how they are going to implement each and every part where the semiconductors plays a very important role. And next the one is uh, connectivity and entertainment. So it's like you have heard about these connected cars and concepts, right? So there is use of the connectivity technologies in the cars nowadays, maybe to transfer information, to communicate the information, maybe uh, in the case of GPS or maybe uh, <clears throat> to get some information, uh, uh, maybe some updated information about maybe road closures or maybe some mapping, so all those things, in all these areas, we have to use what we call as the semiconductors. 
in the case of imaging or maybe in camera maybe in light detection maybe in ultrasound sensors in all these areas we are using what we call the semiconductors so it's like semiconductor plays a very important role that to nowadays in the field called the auto automobile industry so now we'll move on to the next part so the next one is medical industry now it's like in medical industry we have the space makers infrared thermometers or oximeters continuous glucose monitoring systems ventilators remote healthcare i have listed out some of them in the right side also in the image earlier it was like before the covid 19 or uh, before the covid came it was like uh, the remote healthcare was not there or it was not there to some extent <coughs> now uh, after this coronavirus outbreak or something we have every home or every people who are affected they, they have this glucose monitor or if some person are infected or if they have some pressure issues or maybe sugar issues or to uh, monitor their oxygen levels we have everything with us so we have those devices in our home and we have to just measure what is the value so it's like this is being used in those insulin pumps and this uh, glucose monitoring system so if i am in my home and i'm i'm diabetic and i have this high risk of coronavirus or i am infected by covid 19 maybe i have to i i'll be able to i myself will be able to monitor these levels so in all these devices we are making use of what we call the semiconductors now it's like the portable devices now i'll give you one example it's like ventilators so those patients that have severe lung issues we need these ventilators to treat them right these ventilators are often controlled by the what we call the semiconductor chips so they use these semiconductor sensors and maybe processors they have to monitor different things right maybe uh, what is the amount of oxygen per breath or what will happen what are the vital signals how, whether the rate is increasing or whether the rate is decreasing so there are so many factors which needs to be identified in the case of these patient and all so now it's like uh, due to this covid outbreak and all we all are using all these things and it's like semiconductor plays a very important role or a vital role in this area <coughs> So now I'll I'll move on to the next application, and the next application is security. So this is being used in cyber security, maybe in defense field and all. So in cyber security, there are different fields where the semiconductors are being used very high. So the first one is secure board, second one is mutual authentication, then secure communication or encryption, then security life cycle management. So the first one is secure board. It's like uh, it will be using some cryptographic codes or maybe. uh to prevent it from hackers or maybe to prevent it from unauthorized hackers the same is with the mutual authentication so it's like every time my device is uh, maybe some device is getting connected to the uh, network it should be authenticated before receiving or before transferring some data so in all these things we have to or we have to ensure that it's the correct user who is using this maybe in encryption purpose also in encryption decryption purpose also which is being used for transferring these data that is in secure communication and all so it's like i'll i'll give you some idea we have this smart washing machine in our home so what we use to send data to the device maybe if sometimes it needs to uh, send some data to its operator how it is sent so it's like our privacy has to be kept a secret or our details has to be kept a secret and it will send some details regarding it working on something else to that and this is being also used in the se sector called is security life cycle management <coughs> this is mostly uh, with the operation of the iot devices so to manage their security or to enable their authentication or uh, to encryption to promote encryption and all then the next part is defense it's like i'll i'll tell you uh, maybe in the use of radars and all this is being mostly used now there are new types of radars uh, sorry new types of radars and all coming where they make use of the idea called the semiconductors in their working so now i'll i'll move on to and this was a news uh, a biggest news maybe last year i think so most of you have seen in your even our regional newspapers and news channels have posted this issue it's like how a small chip is affecting the world, uh, biggest industries in the world 
So I'll, I'll, I'll briefly give you some idea. So uh, it was like in uh, the brief time to manufacture a chip. It was given in the slide itself. It's minimum three months. And it involves maybe giant factory, dust free room, multi billion dollar machines, molten tin lasers. So there are different things or there are different requirements for a semiconductor chip to be manufactured. So when the pandemic came, maybe due to the COVID 19, there was a steep decrease in the vehicle sale and all. So that's the semiconductor devices were not used that much. But uh, in each home, you know, we were doing everything online and uh, we used to have these classes. Maybe in my home, there are three persons, uh, three children. Each of them should have their uh, separate device to attend this online class. And that was a necessity for all of us. So the need for this mobile phones or other electronic equipments increased, right? So the surge in these uh, sale of these electronic devices have created a demand in the market. And then when the car sales was increased around 2020, the automobile industry was having some issue with the semiconductors or there was no enough semiconductors. And the second issue I would tell is <clears throat> now, now this was a large issue and there was competition between different companies which were manufacturing these semiconductors and all. So now they have started, different companies have started the manufacturing these semiconductors and all. And to get these semiconductors in this aisle, I'll tell you in India, we don't have that much. Semiconductor manufacturing hubs are there in India, but we don't have that much uh, facilities or uh, maybe amenities to have such a huge uh, manufacturing industry in India. And uh, last time, I think the union cabinet has uh, allotted maybe about 76,000 crore for the semiconductor industry, for the development of semiconductor industry across our country. So this is actually a good sign and uh, most uh, the countries uh, in the world which mainly manufacture the semiconductors are US and China. And they are, uh, it's like semiconductor war in papers. It was literally saying like there was semiconductor war between these two countries. Uh, related to the semiconductor supremacy that I'll tell. So there was really competition among the different persons who were manufacturing these semiconductors. And this was something that has happened uh, maybe before months in the semiconductor industry. So that's why I thought I'll, I'll include this or I'll talk about this to you. And now I'll give you some idea about the future of semiconductors. So I, I wish to discuss about two things more. So the first one is SOC and the second one is IP core. So I think most of you have heard about what is SOC or what is IP core. So SOC, we can call this as system on chip. So it's it's simply like an IC or an integrated circuit. And we can call this a thing, single platform. Uh, it's like maybe like a computer or something. And we have different units embedded in that SOC or the system on chip. So we have maybe a central processing unit, maybe input port, output port, or <clears throat> maybe we'll have those memory and all those things in the system. So it's like a miniature system. Uh, it's like, I'll, I'll tell you, we are calling the CPU as the brain of the system, right? So this SOC is the system itself, which will have all the other units, like maybe CPU, input, output, or maybe memory, or maybe another building blocks of the system. <coughs> this is a new concept which came, but there are different advantages and disadvantages also. So it's like the initial cost will be high and there will be uh, the cost can be high and maybe the maintenance also will be high. But there are different advantages like the performance will be high, maybe the power consumption, maybe there will be lesser amount of power consumption and their reliability is high and their life cycle will be high. So this can be used in different applications. Now we will see about something called IP core. So what is mean by this IP is this is intellectual property core in the semiconductor. So what we call this IP core and semiconductor is, it's a particular reusable unit of logic or maybe a design or maybe some functionality. You can call it also as a functionality. So this is developed with the idea of licensing multiple vendors which are using different blocks in the design of chip design. It's like something uh, which come up with the idea of licensing the different vendors of this semiconductor or the chip industry. And this is being classified into mostly two types of cores. IP cores are being classified into two types. The first one is commonly referred as soft core or the soft IP core. And the second one is hard IP core. 
<clears throat> so the thing is that I'll, I'll give you a brief idea. It's like we will have the design. It has to be fully trusted and then it has to be licensed. So this is being mostly used by the uh, electronics engineers and uh, yeah, the electronics category of engineers in the manufacturing of different chips or different uh, maybe processor units or something that is needed for their devices. So this is the basic idea of what we call the IP core. So I think that's all about today's session. And I, I, I think like, or I feel like you have received some information about the semiconductors and also electricity and magnetism. And I feel like this was new to you. So if you have anything, you can, you can contact through this mail ID or this mobile number.